Hi everyone, um, my name is Jennifer Boyce. Um, I'm an Irish Kiwi from Limerick originally, via London for 10 years and arrived here at the beginning of 2008. Can you hear me? I'm not, not good at this speaking stuff. Uh, so my background and training is in architectural technology um, and I've always been interested in the detail of the building so that nuts and bolts have always been my um, interest. Uh, so having spent close to 20 years at the drawing board or behind the computer um, working on detailed design, I learned that my site roles was where I was most happy. Um, so I knocked on a few contractors' doors and it took quite a while for somebody to answer. But um, I eventually uh, moved to the contractor side. Uh, so I've had a few roles since which have all broadened my design management skills and passion. So I started with Fletcher's um, a, as a tenancy coordinator out at Northwest Shopping Centre um, and then moved on again with Fletcher's um, as a stakeholder manager at the NZICC. And yeah, and that hotel is where I met Dan. So we have crossed paths for, for a while. Um, and I believe I ran, ran before him, but I was in there a lot longer before him as well. Uh, and yeah, I'm currently at NZ Strong. Um, so given our time um, allocation, I'm going to focus on contract documentation reviews, consented documentation, RFI shop drawings, the managing, des managing design change, BIM and roles and relationships. Um, I guess touching on what Terence was talking about before, um, I also have to be very close to all of the, the site team. So the PMs, QSs, programmer, services, structure, site managers and site supervisors, but I'm not touching on those tasks today, but feel free to ask questions. Yeah, so having architectural background, God is in the details by Mies van der Rohe back in 1929. I'll touch on that a bit later. So the contract documentation review, um, I think if anyone has worked with me, you will know I'm quite um, <sighs> probably cynical. If it's not drawn, it's not coordinated. So um, that's part of my uh, focus when I uh, interrogate drawings and my advice to designers each time, if it's hard to draw, it's hard to build. Um, so my documentation review uh, being step one, so taking all the specifications and drawings, uh, search everything for TBCs, uh, for contractor to coordinate, contractor to confirm, get your shop drawings and samples required, known, and any known outstanding design elements um, confirmed in the documentation. So if, if we know there will be design through shop drawings expected, get that list uh, populated ASAP. Uh, in the review of the architectural drawings, I carry out the buildability review um, very early in the process. It's a high level structural services coordinated coordination uh, check, but primarily for the facade. Um, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very much focused on uh, construction tolerances and um, yeah, just checking that services can go where they're shown um, and utilizing the uh, subcontractors for the initial reviews so you know use the specialists the precast concrete the facades the pacifiers they, they all um, offer huge benefit um, in those early reviews and then highlight all the areas of concerns that you found to your team um, as early as possible you need to get your procurement um, uh, underway and get those construction, potential construction delays from long leads um, set out. Jim, is this sort of after the main contract's been awarded or is this might be during like a tender process or what's the stage are you going No, this, this is um, awarded. Yeah, so we're doing a deep dive in how much trouble we're in. Would you, <laughs> is there any new, have you seen any entities or anything that's come previously, like for any other sort of Substitutions or other items that might be <coughs> part of the contract, but may not be sort of evident in what you're reviewing. But um, gosh, uh, start that question again. I was just thinking about like if, say, 
during the tender process the contractor kind of puts forward an idea in terms of an alternative or a substitution or might a clarification question or some other information that's perhaps not in the drawings and the specification yeah. but forms part of the contract documents. Is that also reviewed by you in terms of this process? It would be because it would come under that um, any outstanding design elements really. It would fall into that category and we'd probably end up moving it on as a minor variation. Uh, yeah, assuming we have a building consent in our hand. Uh, so assess the information uh, is sufficient to build from, assess the construction tolerances are allowed for, and assess the risk uh, to project and prioritize the issues in their importance. Um, this is just a sheet of random examples of uh, the amount of TBCs you're going to find intermittently uh, spat across the specification. Uh, some of them are par for the course, but some c could catch you out in, in the world of procurement. Um, and when you see something uh, that's critical to an element we need to procure, you need to jump on those TB TBCs. Um, this, oh, sorry, I meant I have these sheets printed out. Um, when I do my reviews, so the construction tolerances, I find a lot of our teams on site don't realize they're permitted in the design to, to have variances in, in structure. Um, so what I've done is extrapolated from the different codes and specifications what, what is typically allowed in, in a commercial build. Um, so your steel can be plus or minus 10 mils out, that, that, sorry, yeah, for the column base or for in-situ concrete, um, you're allowed your plus or minus 15 um, on, that, on that straight edge when you're over six meters. Um, yeah, so I think they're little it's nuggets. In a specification, is it? It will be, yeah, so uh, if it differs, it, it'll be overridden in the specification, but mostly the spec just talks to the code. Um, but, and these are the code references if, if you need to interrogate each. Uh, so I've, I've got a couple of those printed if anybody wants to take them away. Uh, I find they're a very quick go-to when you're checking. Um, so in my set out tolerances reviews, this is an example of um, a slab at grade and a uh, seismic joint in the suspended slab. So the slab at grade, once you start applying your plus or minus 15, you see that you end up at a clash with your RAB, so you can't actually put in your compliant uh, uh, six mil slash nine mil gap. So you need to run that one through. Um, we've um, progressed that on one um, series of projects with, with MetLife. So they've actually added that as a packing zone. They've seen the value in adding that cost straight up. Um, uh, and Correct, yeah, yeah. So you'd, you'd end up with a clash with your RAB. So uh, we, pack, we pack that out uh, to that 15 mils. So your, your tolerance will only ever be within the building, your um, out of tolerance. And then the seismic, so uh, yeah, be, again, it, it's probably because I've been burned on a few projects. So the seismic, um, you, you see the 120 gap, so that's plus or minus 60 mils. Sometimes that's misinterpreted by the designer. So 120 seismic can actually be plus or minus 120, so it could be a 240. But assuming the 120 is accurate, um, once you start adding and subtracting your plus or minus 15, you end up with a uh, plus or minus 45, not a plus or minus 60. It's just an example. And this is, um, I guess, uh, highlighting um, reviews for architectural metalwork because <laughs> the, the, it's very often a pack I find um, isn't worked through structurally entirely. So you end up with quite a few um, conflicts between what the architecture detail, structural detail, and what the QS actually um, schedules. So yeah, this was go through everything. It was an, an interior fit out uh, refurbishment. And it was interior and exterior, pardon me. Um, but I, yeah, I ended up with, I don't know, 40 odd 
items that you needed to um, resolve um, up front. So wh when you're dealing with stainless steel quantities of that um, length, uh, you, yeah, it becomes a, a hell of a long lead item. Um, and the stainless steel, I guess the learning in here is the difference between a 16 mil and a 19 mil was that the 19 mil could only come from overseas. So you automatically had another four months to, to add to your program to, to get that stuff um, in the country. Uh, any questions? Yep. What's your process for dealing with this discovery? Like once you've learned all the gaps or issues, what do you do? They all start forming part of the RFI process. So yeah, you send it to the client or the design teams and start getting those um, on checklists and meetings and workshops. If, if they're significant, workshop them because they could just be a, a quick checklist update. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's the commencement of that RFI process in my experience. Do you find that the tolerances thing is like your most common issue? Yes, yeah. Right. And yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the fact that the, the designer specifies but doesn't detail according to the specification, that, that's a ready um, conflict that we see probably in every project. Yeah, and I can just imagine like certain amounts of you know, our stuff guys going to sort of put it Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then at least or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When it comes to your site more, so you come out for 15 hours and packages. Yes. How do, you, how do you allow for that in cost plan as well? Because I'm sure the sub is allowed for a 15 on packing to 400 living wages. Um, I am not sure how we manage that one cost wise. Because um, <laughs> that, that's probably high labour rate for the wall itself, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the flip side is we can't achieve the facade detail. So, so that, that's a bigger uh, hurt to the problem, or hurt to the project. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the consent to documents, um, this we, we found um, a, a big issue on one of our projects in the center of town. Um, so the building inspector took the stance, if we didn't have a stamped drawing, we couldn't build off it. So the uh, building consent uh, stamped uh, pack from day one um, needed to be on site and we had to build from anything that varied from that had to go through a minor variation or a building consent amendment. So it's, I think we, we all need to focus on uh, the consented documents check. Um, so yeah, so in Auckland the consenting process now, well, probably always required in the Building Act, but requires the provision of shop drawings and PS1s slash code marks from the secondary trades, so that facades for glazing, balustrades, seismic and lifts at the time of the building consent application. So design packages should no longer be broken into detailed design for building consent and then for construction. Um, because of that learning, we're, yeah, I guess getting agreement with the architects that, that the four building consent slash four construction is accepted as a submission for consent. So uh, that I think is, is our, our current preference is for that to happen. Uh, I'm hearing from some that they cannot, will not do that uh, because of the Building Act, but um, if, if you can get that buy-in, yeah, you should. And then the consent amendments and minor variations are tools available to us to get, a des get design changes approved and allow, allow us to continue building. So the drawing revision we build from must have the council stamp to show uh, the building inspector on site and the building inspector has the right to issue a stop works to the site and form a relationship with your building inspector um, once, once you're on site. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, Dan has uh, developed that. This one, um, the stage consenting. Uh, so we're finding it, it's uh, fairly common now to focus on groundworks and structure in isolation and in advance of a complete detailed design. And the 
we're, well, yeah, we find that the risk for major retrospective changes is heightened by what is deemed a minor tweak in the overall scheme still at developed design for the structure already commenced on site. Um, it's just a, an alarm bell really uh, is, is to make sure that, that that design is always aware of what the consented document um, is, documentation is. Uh, this is a bit of a scary story for one of our projects. Um, so it is a very untypical project, but so it was an external reclad. We had 15 building consent amendments and 64 minor variations. So we want you to take some time to think of the time and resources involved to uh, issue the RFI, resolved the design change with a buildable slash affordable solution, receive client approval, process with council before commencing the works on site. Do you have any downtime on site? It's 14 amendments. We, 14 we had probably all in all about a year downtime. downtime. Uh, well, the, the client, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, so losing subcontractors, you know, it, it's just a nightmare. I think it's also the drivers of all of those as well. Pardon me? It's what the drivers have that occur. Um, uh, the, one of the main ones, I guess, was the Grenfell fire. So we had to do a whole redesign of the fire rating of the external cladding. Um, some were scope change because the budget was blown out um, and then the scope got re-included re uh, so then you had to go back again for another consent and yes there, there were client driven changes that, that drove a lot of those building consents but um, yeah the, the one that hurt them was the fire change. Um, so managing the minor variations so anything affecting the codes uh, oh, sorry. Uh, codes uh, B1, B2, C, E2, and F. We're uh, absolutely obliged to uh, put in a minor variation for a design change. Um, this is an example of the documents we would need to prepare. Um, so what, what you need is, yeah, so most contractors I get would get that letter straight up but if you don't have it it can cause you some delay so permission to apply from your client. Uh, an application form filled out with your codes required so the consented information needs to be pr um, in your pack and a report slash new details for the scoping the reason for change with the with the changes and appendices from all relevant consultants so if it's structure, fire, um, facade who do you uh, who do you find defines whether something's a, you know, a minor amendment versus a, a slight variation? Those well, the minor variation is what we hope to get through each time, and the building ins building inspector will tell us your dreaming. Yeah, um, and so you know, you guys are typically in a construct only type environment. Yeah. But you guys are managing that on site. Yes. With that relationship. On yeah, correct. I find the same thing is that ultimately it's, it's more efficient to do it in the coal face, but it's a huge administrative burden, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Quite a good rule of thumb is um, it's a one dimensional change, you can get away with it with a minor variation, so I'm going to change in one thing. If you do a three dimensional like change like the, the wall, the location, and the finish, then it'll become an amendment. Right. So if you're just changing the finish, it's like one dimensional change you can kind of sneak through, but it's, right. it's you know, more than that, I like it. Certainly there's a PS1 on the one. Yeah. I thought it was to do with the, how experienced the site inspector is. Yeah. I'll hold it to Rich. Yes, I guess Dan, part, part of um, breaking that one down would be, so recently on the site I'm on currently, um, the building inspector said that anything that he can't process on site will have to go through an amendment. So if there's too much documentation for him to sift through or too much risk for him, yep. um, he's saying that that will be going um, for an amendment. So I haven't pushed that button yet, so we'll see. <laughs> I'm hoping my relationship is good. Uh, and this is, yeah, just tracking your minor variations. Um, 
uh, yeah, the more information you put in up here and start tracking, the better at the end you'll be able to find your instructions and your cans, your drawings, the consented drawing numbers and the updated drawings. Um, anything that's in orange, I still have to do yet, but that's uh, relevant to the CCC for PS3s. And that will tell you a couple that are still sitting there to be processed or submitted. Do you think the contractor is the best place to manage this process? Does that kind of sit well with you in terms of what you see going on, etc.? Um, well, uh, I would imagine that you have to have a design manager on board to take that responsibility. Uh, there's a lot of admin in, in um, that submission. We did try to get the architect to do it, but yeah, there was pushback. Yeah, so I guess it depends who's best resourced. There's no point, we could have dug our heels in and said, hey, Mr. Architect, we want you to do it. Um, but given the resource issues he's had, we would have yeah, hung ourselves really. So it might be as well to take that extra cost of, of your resource. Surely that comes down though to whether it's a contract alteration or it's actually an omission from the consultant. Uh, um, yeah, you could, you could definitely argue that, yeah. Uh, I think that it's an efficiency thing though, right? If you're, if you're having to arbitrate that on site, right, with someone and you're actually trying to drive the job, it's really hard to have, well, here's the person representing the architect for this and representing the client. It just kind of, it makes sense to synthesize it, um, but it depends, you know, mm. if you've got a gen on site or if you're working with them that doesn't, and they've got someone split across multiple jobs, then actually the client needs a rep on site to manage this. Because I, I imagine in your configuration, you guys aren't taking the time risk on the approval of these things. So, you know, you yeah. are doing a lot of the client's risk management. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Ye
six issues um, of these shop drawings. And this is uh, time and cost can be very difficult to manage within the project constraints. So we recommend you have a good tracking system in place and report clearly to the, si the client on all delays being incurred. Uh, get shop drawings advanced well and uh, get them commenced well in advance of the procurement program dates and that regular honest communication is key. Um, in your request for information, clarity uh, when raising your query will benefit the expediency of the response and highlight to the client slash project manager exactly what the issue is. Yeah, yeah. Use images, make sure you get locations in there. Um, the, res the response may then bring about a design change, not a clarification of a detail, and financially that needs a thorough information thread for both the QS teams to resolve. Um, mostly in-house, we have Aconex on our projects. So we've got a really good system with the project manager um, on, a, on the project I'm on at the moment with Arvida. Um, and we meet every Monday morning um, and go through each and every um, open and outstanding RFI. So you'll see some of the dates there. Th they just get crazy. Um, and yeah, un unless your client is aware to push the subcontractors, um, we find we get absolutely stranded. Um, the shop drawings, so yeah, just, just to touch on uh, the amount of time and admin involved in uh, managing the shop drawings. So this is an extract from a, an architecture specification. Um, the schedule of um, specs is listed in uh, what is it? One, two, three, five, and then the structure and the services. Um, you will always have precast structural steel, metal decking, timber trusses, and for services, mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, active fire, yada yada. So the the initial list that you think you're managing is 18. Um, the this is the tracker we use in house. Now I can jump onto a live Excel document if anyone wants to go through what that tracker or how you populate that tracker. Is there any advantage to running through it? Um, what, what we have is um, obviously the, the drawings being submitted um, and who the subby is and then the Rev1, uh, what we have is the sent from, sent from subcontractor and sent to the consultants on our, our first issue of drawings. And the, once you uh, populate the sent to consultants, it automatically says you have a 10 day uh, turnaround, so it populates that date for you. Um, then. Um, uh, yes, exactly, yeah. So the, yeah, the first two iterations, so you've got your 10, 10 consultants, 10 uh, sub uh, subcontractor update, then back for a second review is five day consultant period and then um, five day subcontractor. So, so you're, I can't even add 30 days, 10, 20, 30 days uh, to get to your four construction um, set of drawings. Um, uh, yeah, so the, co the color code will quickly tell me if it's gray, happy days, it's, we've already got the four construction. If it's blue, um, it's with the um, consultant. Uh, so the consultant's uh, comments are due back on the 18th, they didn't come yet. And if it's that salmon type color, it means I've got the consultant review, I just haven't processed it. Uh, to send to the subcontractor, but uh, as I as I populate and send to the contractor, that spits it out when I need the next iteration from the subcontractor. Um, so I can very quickly see what my tasks are each week once I have that date um, and sheet in front of me. Um, How are you finding that the turn around the, the specifications from the consultants? Um, well, this, this picture kind of tells us um, where we're going in the world of 
uh, developing through shop, shop drawings. So the, the first two, um, yeah, I'd say maybe 50% actually worked in that first two, but we've gone out to seven iterations for some of that scope. Um, Yeah, it'll always be both. Yeah, it'll always be both. And it's one of those challenges, um, develop design through shop drawings. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so that that then th your your drawing pack just gets extrapolated because it gets broken into uh, pack zones, phases. Uh, so you end up with sixty one packs to manage, not eighteen. Um, yeah, so you can probably start doing the maths on how much time that takes. Um, any more questions on that? Is there anything that you can, I guess, think back on in terms of briefing you, like when you're going out to market even with Chase to sort of pull through your expectations or, I don't know, just in terms of the learnings from this process? Oh, yeah, I mean, w your initial catch up with your subcontractor is to go through that scope and if it hits that list of, um, design outstanding, you get the designer in uh, day one so that they're explaining they're explaining the, the what and the subcontractor has to tell you the how, you know, it's that because procurement of materials is really catching us out. Um, I think also it's, it's about using your supply chain too. And one thing, I don't know why we need to really start doing this until recently, particularly on the jobs, is going to the subs, say your steel contractor, all right, what are the issues you can see because they're dealing with this kind of design development through shop drawings constantly. <coughs> what are the issues that we actually properly need to solve before it makes sense for you to start? Because even though it's painful, holding that line of actually not there yet on the input, input design, we don't have enough definition. You know, if you, if you, you know, force the design team to take another month to complete something, we've got through it in three cycles instead of seven, totally worth it, right? Um, and, and also tends to flush out, I find for us, a lot of the issues are scope driven. This consultant's not engaged, we don't know about that thing yet, so this is a question mark, and they come on later. So it's quite good as a way to flush out some of the scope issues early. There's also a lot of cost, obviously. Scope change, cost, question marks, whose cost it is. Yeah. Sure, you've got a comment here that you um, <coughs> based on the different colour code you've got a section where if the documents come back to yourself, you do a bit of a review of the documents as well? Yes. Um, what does that review entail? Because some main contractors will, you know, almost take that shop drawing process review almost upon themselves and start to eventually, you know, mark things up and uh, others will like, just do it as a post box. So where do you guys... Yeah, it, it probably depends on the speciality. If it's architectural and finishes, I'm very confident to look at the design and review the shop drawings against it. But if it's structural, I can only, if, if I have two drawings side by side, I can review. But the engineering review w would have to happen as well. So you know, what, I, what I tend to do is mark up what I see is wrong, but send my markup and the original shop drawings. So, so both are with the consultant. Yeah, it's just interesting because a lot of stuff like this, you know, if you put a pen on it, you, you kind of accept it or change it. Yeah. And the uh, SA 2017 clearly states any design work by the subcontractors is liability responsibility. You can sign the final main contract. That, so it's that. Right. The duty that starts ending up that time. So you can point your level of signing offers. And so, yeah. Know, yeah, I mean, if, if I don't have a consultant design to, to match, I won't, I won't take that risk either. I'll send it to the consultant. Uh, so design change, so yeah, what you want to keep an eye on um, is your, your risk um, and yeah, to prioritize your findings. The design assumptions and our contractor to confirm, your TBCs, your billability issues, your construction tolerances and your product procurement. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll always go to make sure we, we catch up day one uh, with the consultant and the subcontractor um, and the client or the PM, wh whichever the 
project team is, um, you need to get that buy-in of the, yeah, the procurement and and the outcome um, from both parties. We, we yeah, th there's value in the subcontractor having that relationship with with the consultant as well as with us and the client. Um, and yeah, then just make sure you get everything clearly agreed and instructed. So because people on teams, they they change so frequently and you, you lose a lot of information when people leave. So yeah, just get, get ahead of that information going missing. And um, the clients and council, they're best taken through the issue resolution process with a physical representation to clarify why an alternative or a particular detailed process is being proposed. Uh, sometimes the RFIs are too, too complex to be explained on paper. Yeah, I think just doing mock-ups, take the cost of, of that initial mock-up and um, get, get everybody's agreement early on. Uh, so this is an example of um, an interior refurbishment. Um, so just on scope change really, or detail change. So the original tendered um, balustrade, uh, simple enough, easy enough, everything is uh, clarified. Um, but the fixing uh, was into a 150 minimum thick slab, which I didn't see. And the design RFI process only started once we had um, started the demolition. So once we realized that that slab wasn't 150 mils, um, the RFI process then commenced. So th yeah, that's, that's my big learning. Um, make sure you do intrusive surveys. Uh, so the, the significance of that change ended up being uh, with a new stair soffit structure, new fire rating required to all stair structure, new balustrade panel and stanchion design, and a new fixing design. So absolutely everything changed. Uh, so the dollars and the time just uh, mushroomed on that one. Um, we eventually got fairly close to the design. So this, this was the architect's 3D image and this is what we ended up with. But um, I don't know if you can pick how much clunkier the steel actually has to be than the original concept. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, I guess ha hands up here. So that design change just proved too significant to procure, fabricate and install during the centre three month closure. So we ended up working in a live environment, progressing that. And then uh, lessons learned on external, so refurbishment of exterior. Um, and just again, I'm scoping the seismic joint um, change. So the scoped document um, had the, that blue, which is just that fly tower, so that, that box had a seismic joint detailed. The cladding um, on this building, I presume, I don't know if everybody knows, this is the AIT center. Um, the cladding is, has to be installed from bottom up. So the seismic de detail, which then mushroomed into that magenta line, <laughs> all the way around meant we had yeah, months and months of hold up um, to get that through council. That um, went through both the building consent amendment and the minor variation process. Um, because it, again, site findings, we kept fi finding more areas once we started uh, removing the existing claddings. So yeah, investigative surveys is the, the big learning. Um, so the process, I guess, that I would advise is uh, the interrogation of the design drawings for buildability and coordination, workshop at commencement of specialist shop drawings to facilitate engagement between the designers, fabricators and installers, ensure all are clear on requirements, specifications, risks, samples required, costs and program, monitor closely your progress and timeliness, timeliness of issue closeout, visit the factory with the consultant where possible, have site presence once demolition is complete to assess any deviations from design documents, etc. Structural differences can be critical. Uh, ensure you know 
the consultant engagement for construction monitoring and your QA documentation are aligned um, and ensure observ site observation uh, report closeouts. The key one on that one is that's where you need to ensure your PS4 author that you know early on what their requirements are. Exactly. Yeah. The PS4 author to sign off. One that's just a bit test information to do on that balustrade and things like that. Yes, yeah, yeah. And after the thing had been built. Yeah, yeah, we had uh, we had evidence of sorry, this is a bit of a whinge. We had evidence of a site visit um, of the engineer, um, so the note on the site visit was he was here to, to review those fixings, uh, but this site observation never came back with that note on. Um, so the site, site hand, hand notes had it, the formal report didn't, uh, and that engineer left the company, and we ended up having about six months of interrogations for uh, design solutions, um, particularly to the the balustrade, the gosh, the um, void balustrade, jeepers. Um, yeah, so yeah, ma make sure you're across all the the documentation requirements from your um, consultants. Just think about the as far as you we're going back to your consents that when you get the consent conditions. That's the, you have to read those really, really, really carefully because there can be PS4 requirements hidden in those. Correct. If you get too far down the site, all of a sudden you need to reverse engineer it. Yeah. Like for a seismic ceiling or something that's already yeah. closed in. So that's, that's like the number one source of pain. Yeah. And they yeah. yeah. will say that PS4 is required for some or something yeah. like that. So it doesn't go in to say, well, it's up to the, yeah. the peer reviewer that's signing off the PS4 or the engineer. Yeah. What he requires, and what I'm trying to say is they yeah. need to advise us from day one what their requirements are, not post us doing something. You know, yeah. It might be that they want the mill certs or the screw fixing or something, which if you've done it 18 months earlier than they request it, then it's, it's difficult to get it. Whereas if yeah. you know from day one, they say that it's fired, we'll give you the mill certs on that type of screw. Yeah, but uh, taking your point on the building consent amendment, there's a whole new list of stuff that the, they would never have been engaged to do. Um, and if you don't interrogate that list, you can get caught. Mm -hmm. Do you find out on the site map that the inspector wants to see evidence of compliance over and above what's on the documents? Um, I, I guess it's in the documents, but it's hidden as AES, NZS codes and you know, so they're not looking for anything they weren't entitled to see. Really but good, really yeah. good example at the moment. You've got a passive fire schedule, you've got to walk through the building that's in, yeah. and then it's all done, and they go, oh, we don't like that product anymore, we want to see different one. Yes. I can snap you on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are fine. From the council, passive fire is a hot topic, it has been for a little yeah. while now, but we, as of last week, we got questioned that they were the fire engineer and structural engineer to sign off on rafters that go over an IT wall that you know that they're not yeah. happy and just gonna work structurally in a fire rate of situation. It's all documented on the documents but they're now asking for that time inspection chain. Yes, yeah. um, and also you know, if anyone's using boss fireboxes as an issue there with the council at the moment that they want to just a test out this on the fire rate of the product but now on the leakage yes, through the okay. thing, which is Uh, BIM, I'm probably not the best person to talk about BIM, but uh, on my current project, we have used it. Um, I liked that text from uh, the BIM handbook, um, that it's providing an overall view of the project to supplement the information contained in the drawings and schedules. It's a visualization aid. It's for assisting in pro production of schedules of quantities, and it's assisting in the production of shop or fabrication drawings. Um, my gut feel was that the client expected the BIM to, to resolve everything um, and be the, the new contract documentation that we built from. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of lessons learned in that project. Um, 
so our client engaged uh, an independent BIM manager, so not, not part of the consultant team. Um, <coughs> and we already had a cons uh, building consent in our hands. So the purpose of the engagement was to ensure the consent and design was a coordinated structural and services design before, commen before commencement of shop drawings. Um, so they virtually built the building structure from bottom to top. The, con excuse me, the consultant's buy-in is essential to resolve the clashes and fixing issues during the process. And then once the model is complete, the shop drawings process can commence with surety. Now, in, in this uh, engagement, the BIM uh, provider was engaged to do the shop drawings. Um, so I'll expand on lessons learned process and lessons learned. So the, the win, I guess, from site, we're uh, probably 20% through, um, is that the services um, are going in quite fast and nearly drama free. So that, that magic 5% is where we're finding our drama, but uh, in, in regular site time, I think that's a big win for us. And structurally, um, the foundations and slabs were set out, the primary steel and precast panels. Uh, their design was interrogated for coordination uh, to assist the architecture to set out verification and confirmation. So the architect had a good file to use once the shop drawing process w was um, commenced. The secondary structure omission, omissions were highlighted and added. So we, we picked up quite a few items through that process, which was great. Um, and the fire protection, so the subcontractor pr provides, the oh, provides the compliant design which gets coordinated in space with all other services. The mechanical dirt work routes work and the timber roof trusses um, were interrogated for clashes with services and those tweaks were sent back to, to Carter's to get those tweaks added. Um, so the lessons learned, um, this is my little negative slant, uh, leave the specialist detail to the specialists. So the foundation reinforcing structural steel shop drawings, precast panel shop drawings for the reinforcing mold faces, stitch joints, and sprinklers for pipe lengths and material takeoffs. Um, we, we attempted to do each of those in, in this project and yeah, it definitely burned our time. Uh, any questions on BIM? Not that I've much value to give you guys. How long did that process take? Between, I the end of consent and starting the Yeah, so it was scheduled to take four months. So it started in Feb last year. It was supposed to be done by June. Um, so maybe that's not right, March, April, May, June. Um, but we finished it like two weeks ago. You got to stand on site, right? You started on site, Carol. Yeah, so, so, that's, yeah, so that's where you start breaking down all your packages into little bit bites here and there to, to get procurement released. And yeah. The you the experience council also to push up when extensively as part of the concession process? Yes, yes. Yeah, so they've, they've been engaged on this project uh, for building consent. So the, the sh uh, shop drawings went in, so the lifts, lifts, glazing, seismic, lifts, glazing. Balustrade. Balustrade, yeah, Balustrade. yeah Balustrade. so pretty, pretty much, yeah. And windows or yeah. shop drawers. Uh, so I guess, Jamie, you end up going down a road with a particular supplier because he's, you know, monkey toes is a good example. You know, they'll, yeah. they'll provide all that information, but then to go elsewhere, you know, but, uh, which is, the I mean, a lot of trade like lifts, you can go to the market relatively early on, yeah. um, on basic sort of information, a balustrade, I say to an architect who has got a concept and draws it up in just a sketch form, we can get competitive, uh, you know, pricing to make a selection that you're going to go with a unix balustrade as a versus spectrum or whatever, um, to go with certainty on your design, and even with some products, you know, whether it's a membrane waterproofing on decks or something like that. Yes. You can call it a little mini tent as I know that you're going to go down and use a beautiful or RDX or whatever. So that, because 
key is that once you've specified that product, you don't want to change it when it's in your through a consent amendment. Yeah. Um, we totally echo that. The more subcontractor design you get consent in, the better. Um, on our first job in Pacifica, $210 million job. The subs did the PS ones for facade, um, post engineering slabs, building services, and um, IT wall design. Um, we broke it into like I think five or six consents, and across the whole job we had ten amendments, which are really minor things. Um, and it was so efficient, right? Because what what got consented was the coordinated stuff that didn't have to go through another process. Um, yeah. So your building services, you were able to coordinate the rest of the design team during. Yeah, so we had the building services sub doing design through detailed design, yeah. and incumbent building services engineer was peer reviewing them through so that they did all over us. Yeah. That's that's the basic model yeah. now that we do now. Same with Kirkland. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just middle of those pools, we've got a retirement <laughs> sense, you can win on the Amiga one, made a selection that you doubt it, who did the shop drawings, and then we were able to tender to three or four yeah. companies. Yeah. I mean, you were tied to a particular suite, but at least you still had competitive tension in that market. Yeah, and just uh, uh, people want to finish on really the um, shared goal, you know, we, we all want to do a good job, we all want to be happy at, during our work day, I think we need to not lose sight of the, the human element involved here, you know, we all have our own stresses and t time restrictions, uh, I think yeah, keep it tight, keep it human and recognise that we're we're all experiencing the ever tightening programs and we'll all be proud on completion. And one for the site team, I think, yeah, for, for, for me, this is key that I keep in touch with the guys um, and just help them through those processes to make sure our QA is, is um, where we want it to be. For the consultant roles, obviously they, they vary from project to project. Uh, establish what duty for construction monitoring each consultant is signed up to, and what implication for his site visits and site observation reports. Because the higher the frequency, the more admi admin you've got. Uh, we must resource accordingly to close out uh, consultant observation reports in a timely fashion. Um, as issue verification retrospectively, uh, oh, sorry, is uh, of, of a close up element can cause much frustration and cost to all parties later. Um, going back to God is in the details. Uh, this pavilion was 1929. We are nearly a hundred years later in New Zealand. We would fail on E, we would fail on B, we would fail on H, we would fail on F. We've great for flush entry. D, D is sweet. That is me. Any, any questions? That was all fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.